We spent some time covering how, through a brand, an audience recognizes a company, a product, a service, and a reputation. A company works hard to ensure its audience is happy with its products and services. A brand associates products and services with the goodwill and loyalty they have earned with their audience. When properly developed, marketing and promoting your brand correctly should differentiate a product or service from its competition in a significant way, trigger instant recognition with audiences and prospective audiences, remind people of the reputation for which it's known, and it places a company or service top of mind with its audience. Brand management is the process a company or service uses to control its brand. Through brand management, you continue to strengthen the association your brand imprints on your audience by making sure the look and message of each promotional piece supports your brand by reinforcing a specific message. Brand management is also about making brands stronger. Brand strengthening is about message and cadence. A steady drumbeat in the market requires consistent output of new content to the communication channels and marketplace that supports branding and co-branding efforts. Delivering the right message to support your brand is absolutely important. By the end of this lecture, you will develop an understanding about strategic brand management. You'll explore how to link brand value and brand benefits to your strategic brand management. You'll also identify initial key value elements within the brand managing process. Brand management begins with having a thorough knowledge of the term brand. It includes developing a promise, making that promise, and maintaining it. It means defining the brand, positioning the brand, and delivering it. For the time being, we have, and will continue to, focus on brand definition. Brand definition is the overall theme for the first series of the, of the sessions in this unit. The latter sessions will we'll focus more fully on brand positioning and brand delivering. Think of the first half of this unit as a kind of branding boot camp where we break your notions of brand down, then build them back up again before we launch you into the world. Brand management is nothing but an art of creating and sustaining a brand. Branding makes audiences committed to your business. A strong brand differentiates your product from your competitors. It gives a quality image to your business. Brand management includes managing the tangible and intangible characteristics of your brand. We've spent some time already covering the tangible and intangible elements of a brand. You've spent time identifying what these are for your own brands in the various scenarios and templates that you've completed so far. But as a reminder, in the case of product brands, the tangibles include the product itself, price, packaging, and those sorts of things. While in the case of service brands, the tangibles include the audience's experience. Intangible elements include things like emotional connections with a, br with a product or a service. Branding is assembling the various marketing mixed mediums into a whole, so as to basically give you an identity. It is nothing but capturing your audience's mind with your brand name. It gives an image of an experienced and reliable business. It's all about capturing the niche market for your product or service, and about creating a confidence in the, cur in the current and prospective audience's minds that you are a unique solution to their problem. Remember, the aim of branding is to vividly convey brand messages, create audience loyalty, persuade the buyer of a product, and establish an emotional connectivity with an audience. Branding forms audience perceptions about the product or service. It should raise audiences' expectations about the product. The primary aim of branding is to create differentiation. Strong brands reduce audiences' perceived monetary, social, and safety risks in buying goods or services. The audience can better imagine the intangible goods with the help of a brand name. Strong brand organizations have a high market share. 
the brand should be given good support so that it can sustain itself in the long run. It is essential to manage all brands and build brand equity over a period of time. The four steps you see on the screen should come as no surprise at this point. The process of strategic brand management basically involves four steps. The first step is identifying and establishing brand positioning. So what does that mean? Brand positioning is defined as the act of designing the company's offer and image so that it occupies a distinct and valued place in the target customer's mind. I'll repeat that. Brand positioning is defined as the act of designing the company's offer and image so that it occupies a distinct and valued place in the target audience's mind. Key concepts our point of difference was called the mental cap, the core brand associations, and the brand, and the brand mantra, and I'll explain what each one of these are. Points of difference convinces an audience about the advantage and differences of one brand over its competitors. A mental map is a visual depiction of the various associations linked to the brand in the minds of an audience. Core brand associations is a subset of associations, in other words, both benefits and attributes which best characterizes the brand. Again, think about protagonist and the main character in the storytelling elements. Brand mantra is the brand essence or the core brand promise, also known as the brand DNA. You should already be mentally linking these terms to the seven storytelling elements in the six dimensions of meaning. For instance, aspects of point of difference relates to a brand's central premise, or it can be its character, its protagonist, or even its antagonist. Points of difference correlates to the central premise of your story which is all about benefits. Your brand's unique character is also an, an advantage, which again, links to the point of difference. You can also turn this into a character, a protagonist, in other words. A brand's competitors form the referenced, suggested, named, or alluded protagonist, another point of difference. The second step of the brand management process is the planning and implementation of brand marketing programs. And this has three concepts. The first concept in the second step is choosing brand elements. Different brand elements are things like logos, images, packaging, symbols, slogans, etc. Since different elements have different advantages, Marketers prefer to use different subsets and combinations of these elements. The combination you choose depends on the messages you choose to send about your brand and the benefits and advantages you want to communicate about that brand, as well as your overall business strategy. The second concept in this step is integrating the brand into marketing activities and your support marketing program. Marketing programs and activities make the biggest co contributions and can create strong, favorable, and unique brand associations in a variety of ways. The last concept in the second stage is leveraging secondary associations. Brands may be linked to certain central or source factors such as a country, film characters, sporting or cultural events. In essence, what you're doing is you're borrowing or leveraging associations from another brand for your brand in order to create some associations that improves your brand's equity. Some quick examples that come to mind are things that are usually around major sporting events like the Olympics, World Cup matches, cricket test matches, test matches, and the like. Companies large and small expend a great deal of effort to link their brand identities to aspects of these events. 
From lager brands to fast food outlets, mail services, clothing, automobiles, and even supermarkets. Others make a great effort to make other kinds of secondary associations through using celebrities, cosmetic companies, lifestyle magazines, fitness magazines, bottled water companies, are all some examples of industries which typically use a famous face in, in an attempt to capitalize on perceptions about that celebrity, from beauty or handsomeness to fitness or a cool hip factor, even rebellious, rebelliousness individuality, and the like. This kind of secondary association can be a powerful thing. However, it tends to ultimately be quite short-lived. The association can only last or be effective and positive or persuasive for as long as the desired attribute for that face continues to be associated with it. The third step in this process is Measuring and interpreting brand performance. This too has three key concepts. The first concept is referred to as brand audit. A brand audit is an assessment of the value or the equity of a brand in an audience's mind. Brand audits suggest ways to improve and leverage that perception. The second concept in this step is called the brand value chain. The brand value chain helps you to better understand the financial impacts of your brand marketing investments, which can be time, money, or both. The last key concept in this third step is called the brand equity measurement system, which is a set of tools and procedures you use, which informs your tactical decisions in the short and long term. They help you prioritize your marketing activity based on what's called a return on investment, or ROI for short. In layman's terms, ROI tells you which activities yields the best results and sometimes the quickest outcome, which is usually financial. For instance, if you are a nonprofit that relies on fundraising, you may find that your tweets produce more donations more quickly than your Facebook page, so you can strategically decide to spend more effort tweeting than posting Facebook updates. Another example might be a clothing designer who finds that his or her Pinterest pins get shared far more often and lead to increased sales more quickly than his or her Twitter feed. This isn't to say that you use only one medium from your available marketing mix. What this means is that it would be more strategic to focus more on those mediums in your marketing mix that yield the strongest outcomes that you desire over the other mediums which you still continue to use, just not at, th at the same level of depth. Again, the marketing outcomes you choose for your brand will vary, will vary depending on your needs or requirements. New brands in the market will more than likely have a priority outcome based around building a brand awareness or recognition or credibility. Once established, that same brand's priority will change to establishing trust audience advocacy, and increased sales. No matter the focus, you will always want to measure brand equity, which leads quite nicely to the last step in this process. The last step in the brand management process is growing and sustaining brand equity. There are three concepts in this stage, which will probably come as no great surprise. The first concept in this step is defining the brand strategy. This captures the brand branding relationship between the various products or services offered by a business or a service. An example of this would be Coke in its relationship to Coke Zero and Diet Coke. The second concept in this step is managing brand equity over time. This requires taking a long-term view as well as a short-term view of marketing decisions as they will affect the success of future marketing programs. You do this by asking what it is you want to achieve in the short and the long term, what's possible to achieve in the short term and the long term, and what it is you have to achieve in the short term and the long term. The last key concept is managing brand equity over geographic boundaries, market segments, and cultures. Section 8 of this unit focuses exclusively on this one concept. 
But basically, marketers need to take into account international factors, different types of audiences, and the specific knowledge about the experience and behaviors of the new geographies, or what's called the marketing segments, when expanding the brand overseas or into new audience tribes. And again, one of the classic examples of this was the Chevrolet Nova example that I gave a few slides earlier. And this is one of the few times where I, I apologize, but I do have to actually use the word customer um, as much as it grates my sensibilities. Right, so a customer-based brand equity, for short, that's CBBE, is a way of assessing the value of a brand in an audience's mind. Branding can increase profitability by basically filling in gaps in the audience's knowledge and by offering assurances in the form of promises. The CBBE model squarely centers that value in the minds of an audience. It compels businesses and services to define their brands according to a defined hierarchy of qualitative or common sense audience impressions. These impressions are often laid out in a pyramid-shaped level. They consist of salience, performance, imagery, meaning, judgments, feelings, and resonance. Don't worry about writing all that down just yet. You'll see this represented in a few screens. Equity can be considered the sum total of values associated with a brand. These might include awareness, loyalty, or recognition. The greater the equity, the more likely audiences will trust and choose one company's products and services over a rival's. Additionally, equity capitalizes on normal psychological tendencies, such as the sometimes longer memory about negative experiences, or the cognitive laziness that creates loyalty through an audience's unwillingness to choose unfamiliar products over familiar brand products. Basically, what all of the text on the screen is saying is that the application of the CBBE model is founded on an audience-based approach to brand equity. The cause and effect model provides a comprehensive means of covering important branding topics, as well as a better understanding of the position of a brand in the minds of an audience. This model and measurement system may be a useful management tool for the improvement of audience-based relationships. In this way, the model can help, help brand managers to set strategic directions and support their decisions with a view to creating stronger brands. Okay, I can just feel you just yelling, yay, more steps, but yes, there are more steps. Let me spend a little time elaborating by what's meant by two terms, branding ladder and building blocks. Branding ladder refers to the various benefit levels which a, a brand provides to its audience. Over the life cycle of a brand, we project aspects of a brand to gain audience loyalty. The term is actually coined by profess Professor Kevin Lane Keller, who wrote the book Strategic Brand Management. And it's no coincidence that I feature a lot of his writing throughout this whole branding unit. He really is quite the guru and quite the god of the topic. The branding ladder itself consists of the following three levels. First one, attributes. It refers to the physical features of the product, like specifications. If we consider the example of a mobile phone, the attributes could be the size, the weight, the processing speed, the operating system. So that's attributes. Second one, functional benefits. This refers to the benefits that are rendered to the audience by the, attribute, by the attributes of the product. In a mobile phone, again, functional benefits include speed, memory, interface experience. The last one is called emotional benefits, and this refers to, ha to how the product or the service connects with the consumer in daily life throughout its usage. Using a mobile phone again, mobile phone can provide different benefits for its users like gaming, messaging, browsing. Depends on that person's particular preferences.
Over its life cycle, a brand is required to travel through these levels in order to gain a loyal audience base. Some of the most successful brands have been in existence for decades because they've been able to successfully pass through all three of these levels. Building blocks are the stages that must be in place for you to reach the top of the pyramid and to develop a successful brand. We'll be looking at the branding ladder and building blocks over the next couple of slides. Here's the pyramid and the dimensions that I referred to a bit earlier. Feel free to pause the video at this point if you wish to write the information on this slide down. Okay, the customer-based brand equity model, which you see here, is about developing a strong brand. The CBBE model is based on four questions that are typically asked by an audience. First one is, who are you? Which has everything to do with brand identity. Second question is, what are you? And that's your brand's meaning. The third question, what do I think or feel about you? Which all has to do with your brand responses. And the last one, what kind of association would I like to have with you? Which is about brand relationships. The order of these four questions is known as the branding ladder. The importance of this order lies in the fact that, without an identity, the following things happen. First thing, we really can't establish a meaning. Second thing, responses won't occur unless the meaning has been established. And three, without the proper responses being elicited, a relationship with, the, with an audience can't be forged. So if you had to make your brand stronger, would you know how to do it? Many factors influence the strength of a particular product or brand. If you understand these factors, you can think about how to launch a new product effectively, or work out how to turn a struggling brand into a successful one. So now let's look at the Keller's brand equity model. This tool highlights four steps that you can follow to build and manage a brand that audiences will support. So, a little bit of an overview about this model first. Keller's Brand Equity Model is also known as the Customer-Based Brand Equity Model, CBBE. Kevin Lane Keller, a marketing professor at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth College, developed the model and published it on his, in his widely used textbook, Strategic Brand Management. The concept behind brand equity, the Brand Equity Model is a pretty simple one. In order to build a strong brand, you must shape how an audience thinks and feels about your product or service. You have to build the right type of experiences around your brand so that your audience has specific positive thoughts, feelings, beliefs, opinions, and perceptions about it. When you have strong brand equity, your audience will basically buy more from you. They'll recommend you more often to other people, they're more loyal, and you're less likely to lose them to competitors. The model that you see on the screen illustrates the four steps that you need to follow in order to build a strong brand equity. The four steps of the pyramid represent four fundamental questions that your audience will ask, which we've gone over uh, previously. And they usually often ask these to themselves subconsciously. The four steps contain six building blocks that must be in place for you to reach the top of the pyramid and to develop a successful brand. So let's look at each step and building block in detail and discuss how you can apply the framework and strengthen your brand. Step one addresses brand identity with the question, who are you? In this first step, your goal is to create brand salience or awareness, in other words. You need to make sure that your brand stands out and that your audience recognizes it and is aware of it. You're not just creating brand identity and awareness here. You're also trying to ensure that brand perceptions are correct at the key stages of the buying process. Here's an application as an example. To begin, you first need to know who your audience and its constituent tribes, who they are. Research your market to gain a thorough understanding of how your audience sees your brand and explore whether there are different marketing segments or tribes with different needs and different relationships with your brand. Next, you identify how your audience and its tribes 
narrows down their choices and decide between your brand or a competitor's brand. What decision-making process does your audience go through when they choose your product? How are they classifying your product or your brand? And when you follow their decision-making process, how well does your brand stand out at the key stages of this process? You're able to sell your product or provide your service because it satisfies a particular set of your audience's needs. This is your unique selling proposition, or USP. You should already be familiar with these needs, but it's important to communicate to your audience how your brand fulfills these needs. Does your audience understand your USPs when they're making their buying decisions? By the end of this step, you should understand whether your audience perceives your brand as you want them to, or whether there are specific perceptual problems that you need to address, either by adjusting your product or service, or by adjusting the way that you communicate your message. Identify the actions that you need to take as a result. For more information regarding salience, what it is, and how to measure it, I recommend reading the article, Conceptualizing and Measuring Brand Salience, by Jenny, I believe her surname is Romanuic, and Byron Sharp, which can be found in the reading room. Step two is another aspect of brand meaning conveyed by the question, what are you? Your goal in step two is to identify and communicate what your brand means and what it stands for. The two building blocks in this step are contained by performance and imagery. Performance defines how well your product meets an audience's needs. According to the model, performance consists of five categories, primarily characteristics and features, product reliability, durability, service, availab service ability, service effectiveness, efficiency, empathy, style and design, and lastly, price. A good example of brand meaning is Patagonia. Patagonia makes high quality outdoor clothing and equipment, much of which is made from recyclable materials. Patagonia's brand performance demonstrates its reliability and its durability. People know that their products are well designed and stylish, and that basically their garments won't let them down. Patagonia's brand imagery is enhanced by its commitment to several environmental programs and social causes, and its strong reduce, reuse, recycle values make the audience actually feel good about purchasing products from an organization with an environmental conscience. So let's apply this. The experiences that your audience have with your brand comes as a, a direct result of your product's performance. Your product must meet and ideally exceed their expectations if you want to build loyalty. You'll be using tools in session five, namely an, what's called an empathy map, a value proposition canvas, and a, a branding model canvas that will help you identify your audience's needs and then explore how you can translate these needs into a high quality product or service. Next, Think carefully about the type of experience that you want your audience to have with your product. Take both performance and imagery into account and create a brand personality. Again, identify any gaps between where you are now and where you want to be and look at how you can bridge these. Establish meaning to the brand so that when an audience thinks about your brand, they strategically link both tangible and intangible brand associa associations with your brand. Performance dimensions include aspects like primary characteristics, secondary features, product reliability, durability, serviceability, service effectiveness, service efficiency, empathy, style, design, and price. Imagery encompasses aspects such as user profiles, purchase and usage situations, personality and values, history, heritage, and experiences. 
These are usually the intangible aspects of a brand and can be formed directly via your audience's experiences. Perceptions can be formed indirectly via external marketing communications, advertising, and word of mouth. When it comes to intangible aspects of a brand, some other things you might like to think about would include, again, user profiles, anything that's audience or personally centered, things like age, gender, race, income, careers, attitudes towards life, social issues. Another example of an intangible would be your organization itself its size. Some people are, are predisposed to liking small, smaller organizations rather than larger ones. Or the type of organization that you are, the perception of you whether you're caring or not. There's also things to consider such as purchasing and usage situations. There's going to be an intangible perception depending on whether you're a department store, an online shop, or a boutique establishment. It could also have something to do with location, whether, you, whether you're inside or outside someone's town, state, region, county. For instance, if you're, if you're in the, the food preparation business, an intangible impression would be something about whether you're a formal establishment or informal, whether people can dine in or take away. Boil down. An audience often chooses brands that they perceive and aspire to be themselves. So the brand personality needs to be, they need to perceive that a brand's personality is consistent with their own. History, heritage, and experiences also have a part to play in the, inter the intangible benefits. Brands may use associations to relate to an audience's recollection of personal or shared experiences. Brands can become iconic by using these experiences to tap into an audience's hopes and dreams. For instance, let's take uh, L'Oreal. L'Oreal uses spokespeople from all ages, whether they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, for each of their products, and they do this to tap into each market segment that they have. By doing this, L'Oreal is combining the experience from women of all ages who can share together their knowledge and personal experience of the brand. Also, the history behind the company and the endorsement that these spokespeople make creates a sense of hope and dreams that one day a consumer who uses L'Oreal can aim to actually be like these, spoke these spokesmodels and feel like they're genuinely worth it. An audience also responds to your brand according to how it makes them feel. Your brand can evoke feelings directly, but they also respond emotionally to how a brand makes them feel about themselves. According to the model, there are six positive brand feelings. Warmth, fun, excitement, security, social approval, and self-respect. So let's look at it, an application of this. First, remember the four categories of judgments. Considering the following questions carefully in relation to these. What can you do to improve the actual and perceived quality of your product or your brand. How can you enhance your brand's credibility? How well does your marketing strategy communicate your brand's relevancy to people's needs? How does your product or brand compare with those of your competitors? Next, think carefully about the six brand feelings listed above. Which, if any, of these feelings does your current marketing strategy focus on? What can you do to enhance these feelings for your audience? Identify actions that you need to take as a result of asking these questions. And hopefully at this point as well, you're beginning to map all of this onto the seven storytelling elements and the six levels of meaning because again, all of this is very interrelated. Step four covers brand resonance. And this is framed in the question, how much of a connection would I like to have with you? Brand resonance sits at the top of the brand equity pyramid, 
because it's the most difficult and the most desirable level to actually reach. You've achieved brand resonance when your audience feels a deep psychological bond with your brand. Color breaks resonance down into four categories. First, behavioral loyalty. This includes regular repeat purchases. Second, attitudinal attachment. Your audience loves your brand or your product and they see it as a special purchase. Third, sense of community. And this basically means your audience feels a sense of community with people associated with your brand, including other tribe members and company representatives. The fourth, active engagement. This is the strongest example of brand loyalty. This means your audience is actively engaged with your brand, even when they're not actively purchasing it or consuming it. This could include joining an online club related, related to the brand, participating in online chats, marketing rallies, or even events. These are people who are following your brand on social media or taking part in some other kind of uh, additional related activity. Your goal in this last stage of the pyramid is to strengthen each resonance category. For example, what can you do to encourage behavioral loyalty? Consider gifts with purchases, discounts, loyalty programs. Ask yourself what you can do to reward audience members who are champions of your brand. What events could you plan and host to increase audience involvement with your brand or product? Basically, at the end of the day, it's just a matter of listing the actions that you'd like to take to reward their support. Okay, so let's put all of this together using an example. Julie's recently been put in charge of a, of a project to turn around an underperforming product. The product is a high quality, fair trade, organic tea, but it's never achieved the sales and audience loyalty that the organization expected. Julie decides to use the brand equity pyramid to think about the kind of turnaround effect. So step one, she starts with brand identity. Julie's target audience is mid to high income, socially conscious women. After careful analysis, she knows that she's marketing in the correct category, but she realizes that her marketing efforts aren't fully addressing the audience's needs. She decides to change the message from healthy delicious tea to delicious tea with a conscience, which is more relevant and meaningful to her specific target market. The next step in her process is identifying brand meaning. So next, Julie examines the product's meaning, and she looks at how the company communicates that meaning to its audience. The performance of the tea is already moderately high. It's a single source, fair trade tea, of a higher quality than the competitor's product. After assessing the organization's service effectiveness, Julie's kind of disappointed to find that many of her representatives lack empathy with the audience members who basically complain. So she puts everyone through a comprehensive audience service class to improve responses to audience, audience complaints and feedback. Last, Julie decides to post to the company's website basically personal, personal stories from the fair trade farmers who grow and pick the tea. And by doing this, she aims to educate her audience about how beneficial this practice is for the people around the world. The third step for Julie is looking at brand response. So after going over the four brand response judgments, Julie realizes that perceived quality might be something of an issue. The tea itself is really of high quality, but the pack size is smaller than the ones her competitors use. Julie doesn't want to lower the price, as this might affect how her audience actually assesses quality, so she decides to offer more tea in each box in order to surpass expectations. She also decides to enhance the tea's credibility by becoming fair trade certified through an independent third party organization. Julie knows that her target audience care deeply about fair trade. She decides to promote the organization's efforts by participating in a number of fair trade events around the country. She also sets up a social networking framework 
to involve her audience in the organization's, organization's fair trade efforts. And she creates a forum on the company website where people can discuss issues surrounding fair trade. She also commits to championing the efforts of other fair trade organizations. One final note regarding the CBBE pyramid. Basically, there are two pathways from the bottom step to the top step, a cold pathway and a hot pathway, and I'll explain each. Building utilitarian associations with the brand creates a cold pathway up the pyramid. Utilitarian associations, they don't really typically convey much in the way of emotions or feelings. An example of a cold pathway includes Cadillac transforms its business image via performance and just performance. So an example would be from car and driver review with a folding hardtop that completely disappears at the touch of a button. The XLR presents a sleek and clean profile. And the review goes on to say under the XLR's hood lies its most significant major mechanical distinction. 4.6 liter North Star V8 upgraded in a variety of ways for improved performance, emissions, and fuel economy. Now the new ad strategy is to move from heritage, the kind of classic caddies morphing into models, models of performance, you know, all based on improved en you know, engineering and speed. On the one hand, you know, there are benefits. The benefits do revitalize the Cadillac, Cadillac brand, and the average age of buyers is dropped, and resale values are rising. I guess, you know, unless you're a motorhead, you're not going to, it may particularly sway you, you know, the functionality of the environmental, environmentally friendly aspect might appeal to you. But overall, this is all about utilitarian values. It's something you would never see, perhaps, a clothing company do. You're not going to really get terribly excited about, say, cut. You might get excited about fabric. You know, again, those are all utilitarian values of clothing. But traditionally, clothing, garments, those sorts of things, they're typically market to, marketed to you through the hot aspect, which I'm going to go over now. Hot pathways build imagery and feelings for a brand. So take the MasterCard and the, and the Priceless campaign, for example. Visa and American Express were targeting high-end audiences pretty much at the same time. MasterCard saw that there was an increase in purchasing power of middle-class Americans. Its branding theme was living the good life. This wasn't about the accumulation of material things and stuff. It was more about the sharing of meaningful moments with loved ones and close friends. Its catchphrase there are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. The benefits for MasterCard by using this kind of warm approach uh, was basically it gained a uh, rather relevant market share in the competitive credit card market. One final note regarding the CBBE pyramid. Basically, there are two pathways from the bottom step to the top step, a cold pathway and a hot pathway, and I'll explain each. Building utilitarian associations with the brand creates a cold pathway up the pyramid. Utilitarian associations, they don't really typically convey much in the way of emotions or feelings. An example of a cold pathway includes Cadillac transforms its business image via performance and just performance. So an example would be from car and driver review with a folding hardtop that completely disappears at the touch of a button. The XLR presents a sleek and clean p profile. And the review goes on to say, under the XLR's hood lies its most significant major mechanical distinction. 4.6 liter North Star V8, upgraded in a variety of ways for improved performance, emissions, and fuel economy. Now the new ad strategy is to move from heritage the kind of classic caddies morphing into models, models of performance, you know, all based on improved en you know, engineering and speed. On the one hand, you know, there are benefits. The benefits do revitalize the Cadillac, Cadillac brand, and the average age of buyers is dropped, and resale values are rising. I guess, you know, unless you're a motorhead, you're not going to, 
it may particularly sway you know, the functionality of the environmental environmentally friendly aspect might appeal to you but overall this is all about utilitarian values it's something you would never see perhaps a clothing company do you're not going to really get terribly excited about say cut you might get excited about fabric you know again those are all utilitarian values of clothing but traditionally Clothing, garments, those sorts of things, they're typically market marketed to you through the hot aspect, which I'm going to go over now. Hot pathways build imagery and feelings for a brand. So take the MasterCard and the, and the Priceless campaign, for example. Visa and American Express were targeting high-end audiences pretty much at the same time. MasterCard saw that there was an increase in purchasing power of middle-class Americans. Its branding theme was living the good life. This wasn't about the accumulation of material things and stuff. It was more about the sharing of meaningful moments with loved ones and close friends. Its catchphrase, there are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. The benefits for MasterCard by using this kind of warm approach uh, it was basically it gained a uh, rather relevant market share in the competitive credit card market. Boiled right down, the main difference between cold and hot has to do with cold is all about the tangible. You're accentuating and emphasizing the tangible benefits of your brand, your product, and your service. Whereas on the hot side, it's all about making those emotional, kind of aspirational connections. It's very, very intangible. It's very, very abstract. So again, boiled down to its essence, cold is about the tangible, hot is about the intangible. I've spent a little bit of time discussing marketing mixes and how these relate to the CBB model specifically and how they also relate to brand stories and strategy. I'll be covering the subject of marketing mix over the last slides of this session. So again, coming back to our definition about marketing. When it comes to marketing, the definition that many marketers actually learn as they start out in the industry is this one. Putting the right product in the right place, at the right price, at the right time. It's simple. You just need to create a product that a particular group of people want, put it on sale someplace that the same people can visit regularly, price it at a level which matches the value they feel they get out of it, and do all that at a time they want to buy. Hey, then you've got it made. It's, it's simple and easy. There is a lot of truth in this idea. However, a lot of hard work needs to go into finding out what an audience actually wants and, if, and basically identifying where they want to do their shopping. Then you need to figure out how to produce the item at a price that represents value to them. And then basically getting it to all come together at a critical time. But if you get just one element wrong, it can spell disaster. You could, be left, you could be left promoting a car with amazing fuel economy in a country where fuel is very cheap. So that's not really consideration. Or publishing a textbook after the start of the new school year. Or selling an item at a price that's too high or too low to attract the people that you are targeting. The marketing mix is a good place to start when you're thinking through your plans for a product or a service, and it helps you avoid these basic kinds of mistakes. The marketing mix and the four P's of marketing are often used as synonyms for each other. In fact, they really aren't necessarily the same thing. Marketing mix is a general phrase used to describe the different kind of choices organizations have to make in the whole process of bringing a product or a service to market. The four P's is one way, probably the best known way, of defining the marketing mix. It was basically first expressed about 1960 by a chap called E.J. McCarthy. The four P's are product, in our case product or service, but product, place, price, and promotion. A good way to understand the four P's is by the questions that you need to ask to define your marketing mix. 
Here are some questions that will help you understand and define each of the four elements. So product or service. These are the questions you need to ask. What does the audience want from the product or service? What need does it satisfy? What features does it have to meet these needs? Are there any features that I've missed out? Am I including costly features that the audience actually, they won't actually use? Another question, how and where will an audience actually use my product or engage my service? What does it look like? How will my audience experience it? What size or sizes, colors, and so on should it be? What am I going to call it? How am I going to brand it? How is it different from that of my competitors? What is the most it can cost to provide and still be sold sufficiently at profitable levels? Here are some questions you can ask about place. Where do buyers actually look for my product or service? If they look in a store, what kind of store? Is it a specialist boutique, in a supermarket, or both? Do they look online or offline? Do they look direct, or do they want to see it via a catalog? How can I access the right distribution channels? Do I need a sales force? Do I need to attend trade fairs? Do I need to make online submissions? Or do I need to send samples to a catalog company? What do my competitors do? And how can I learn from that and or differentiate myself from them? Those are all questions about place. Now questions you should ask yourself about price are as follows. What is the value of the product or service to my audience? Are there established price points for products or services in this particular area? Is the audience price sensitive? Will a small decrease in price gain me extra market share? Or will a small increase be indiscernible? So any gain, you know, will there be any gains to be had in extra profit margins? What discounts should be offered to trade audiences? or to other specific segments of my market? How does my price compare with that of my competitors? And some questions you can ask yourself about promotion. Things like, where and when can I get my marketing messages across to my target audience? Will you reach your audience by advertising in the press, or on TV, or radio, or on billboards? Will you do it by using direct marketing mail shots? through PR or on the internet. When is the best time to promote? Is there a seasonality in the market? Are there any wider environmental issues that suggest or even dictate the timing of your market launch or the timing of subsequent promotions? How do your competitors do their promotions? And how does this affect your choice of promotional activity? The four P's model it's just one of many marketing mix lists that have been developed over the years. And while the questions we've listed above are key, they're just a subset of the detailed probing that may be required to optimize your marketing mix. So when it comes to actually using the 4P's marketing mix model, basically it can be used to help you decide how to take a new offer to market. It can also be used to test your existing marketing strategy. Whether you're considering a new or existing offer, follow the steps below will basically help you define and improve your marketing mix. Start by identifying the product or service that you want to analyze. Second, now go through and answer the four P's question as defined and as detailed as you possibly can. Always try asking why and what if questions to challenge your offer. For example, Ask yourself why your target audience needs a particular feature. What if you were to drop your price by 5%? What if you offered more colors? Why sell through wholesalers rather than direct channels? What if you improved your PR rather than just relying on TV advertising? And some tips and tricks. 
Check through your answers to make sure that they're based on sound knowledge and facts. If there are any doubts about your assumptions, identify any market research or facts and figures that you need to gather. Once you have a well-defined marketing mix, try testing the overall offer from an audience's perspective by asking audience-focused questions like these. Does my product or service meet my audience's needs? Will they find it when, where they shop? Will they consider it's priced favorably? And will the marketing communications actually reach them? Always keep on asking questions and making changes to your mix until you're truly satisfied that you have optimized your marketing mix, given the information and the facts and the figures that you actually have available. Review your marketing mix regularly, as some elements will need to change as the product or service and or its market grow, mature, adapt in an ever-changing competitive environment. Some key points for you to ponder. The marketing mix helps you to find the marketing elements for successfully positioning your market offer. As I said, one of the best known models is the four Ps. We've just spent some time going over that. And again, this will help you define your marketing options in terms of product, place, price, and promotion. Use the model when you're planning at any new venture or evaluating an existing offer to optimize the impact with your target audience. You'll find additional reading about this subject in the reading room. Over the next few slides, I'm going to solely focus on one of the four P's, promotion. Promotion is the means by which we craft and convey our branding messages. Like any, like any industry, there's standard lingo that's used in the marketing, communication, promotions world. Two of them are below the line and above the line. Above the line, ATL for short, and below the line, BTL for short. Well, these forms of advertising are two terms that are bandied around so much these days in the advertising world. It might be worth our while to begin this discussion about marketing mixes by kind of defining what constitutes the metaphoric line. What is the line that you're either above or below? To quote Michael John Baker from the marketing book, the terms above the line and below the line they came into existence around 1954 with the company Procter & Gamble. Uh, and basically, Procter & Gamble were paying their advertising agencies a different rate and separately from the agencies who took on other kinds of forms of activities. What are ATL and BTL activities? Well, they seem simple enough. Above the line advertising is where mass media is used to promote brands and reach out to the target audience. These include conventional media things as we know it, such as TV, radio advertising, print, and some aspects of the internet, banner advertising, and pay-per-click, for example. This is communication that is targeted to a wide spread of an audience and isn't specific to an individual consumer. ATL advertising tries to reach out to the mass as a consuming audience. And if you can remember my comment about the old paradigm of marketing, this is exactly that paradigm. Below the line advertising is more one-to-one, -one, and it involves the distribution of pamphlets, handbills, stickers, promotions, brochures placed at point of sale, banners, and placards. It could also involve product demos, and samplings at busy places like malls, in marketplaces, or even residential complexes. For certain markets, like rural, rural markets, where the reach of mass media like print or television is limited, BTL marketing with direct consumer outreach programs do make the most sense. When budget is an issue and the brand wants to have a true audience connection, BTL simply has better return on investment. Other below-the-line activities could include road shows or moving hoardings with the ad of a product, logos on vehicles, or otherwise vehicles with company branding, 
and promotional staff, interacting with people, demonstrating a product, and distributing lit literature about the product. BTL promotion also includes things like PR and sales promotions that are handled directly either by the company itself or outsourced to specific PR agencies or sales promotion agencies and may or may not be related to an overall advertising campaign. BTL will be a, will be a preference when you need to have a personal interaction with, a cons with an audience, especially in a very, very crowded marketplace. What you see on the screen is an alternative way of breaking up sales into the factors estimated by the model. You can see a representation of how an overall marketing budget can be split into its constituent parts. You can also see which parts have more emphasis in terms of spending output than others. The determination of each is made on a particular company's needs, goals, and resources that are available. The takeaway from this slide is that each form of promotion has an increasing and diminishing return of scale. In other words, when there is an increase in engagement and or sales with the product through a specific marketing medium, and this is as a result of an investment in that medium, and again that investment can be either time or money, there is an increasing return of scale. So increased investment leads to an increased engagement, which is an increasing return of scale. Flipping this on its head, when there is a decrease in engagement and or sales with a brand through a specific marketing medium, and again, that investment can be time or money, we call this a decreasing return of scale. That means no matter what you spend, be it time or money, there won't be a positive return on your investment. That is when you must return to your brand strategy and your audience research to assess whether it's the brand, your messages, the brand experience, or the marketing medium that's failing. If you're not blogging enough, for instance, you may need to blog more for a better return on your investment, and vice versa. If you're blogging four to five times a week and engagement begins to dip, you'll need to consider whether you should be blogging less. This is true of Facebook posts, tweets, and YouTube videos. As for traditional advertising, be it TV or radio, we all know how we feel when we're bombarded by the same advert over and over and over and over again. That feeling within the marketing industry is called oversaturation, which always ultimately leads to a decreasing return. There's only so many times people want to hear the same story within a given time frame. Understanding your audience will tell you what marketing channels work best for your brand and how many times your audience actually wants to hear your story and even when they want to hear your stories. For Aardvark Records, in Europe, the UK, North America, and throughout Latin America, they wanted to, our audience didn't want to hear from us any more than three times a week. And, for whatever reason, they wanted to hear from us between the hours of 4 p.m. and 9 p.m., Wednesdays through Fridays. This, of course, was for our online activity. But having that depth and wealth of information was invaluable. In previous sessions, I've used phrases like audience touch points or contact points, and this model is a perfect representation of what I mean by that. The purchase funnel is a model which describes the theoretical audience journey from the moment of first contact with your brand to the ultimate goal of making a purchase. It literally is some, it represents from start to finish. This model is important when marketing your business as it provides a method of understanding and tracking the behavior of an average audience throughout the whole sales process. This model can also help with the following things. Planning marketing campaigns, highlighting areas in order to improve your conversion rates, and by that I mean converting people from being a potential customer to an actual audience member, evolving the sales process, and lastly, designing audience relationship management systems. The shape, number of stages, and duration of the process can vary depending on both your audience and the nature of your product or service, as well as many, as well as many other factors. Many different v versions of this have been produced, but the fundamental stages always remain the same. 
a funnel shape is used as it describes the natural loss of potential audience members at each stage of the process. Many people may be aware of a particular brand, but this doesn't mean that they'll actually purchase a product. It's worth noting that the purchase funnel focuses on the decision-making path of a typical consumer. This is a diff different evolution of the sales funnel, which describes the typical active process a salesperson can take in order to close a potential deal. The diagram on the screen summarizes the modern purchasing funnel, taking into account the emergence of internet research. It includes things like post-purchase behavior, and I'll explain what each one of these is. Stage one is about pre-awareness. At this stage, an audience has no previous contact with your brand. Stage two is awareness. People can be made aware of your brand with or without the desire to purchase. Awareness can be based on a communications message, word of mouth, or independent discovery. The purchase intent trigger that you actually see on the screen, that orange line, is the moment at which the consumer starts thinking about a purchase. It could be triggered by an event, a change in circumstances, a pay rise, some sort of a need, or even seeing an advertising message. Stage three is about research and familiarity. At this point, a potential audience member has decided they want or need a product similar to yours. They're more than likely to start reading reviews, learning about the features, making comparisons, asking for opinions, and using the internet to research their options in detail. This phase of the process can be lengthened or shortened depending on the value of the product. People are, people are generally unlikely to spend time researching economy-baked beans. Stage four is about opinion and shortlist. Decision on the most likely purchases. This could be in the form of a written list, a mental note, or bookmarked websites. Stage five is about consideration. And this is about deciding between the most likely purchases, taking test drives, going to a product demonstration, asking the opinion of people who've already made that, that purchase. Stage six is about decision and purchase. This is about that final decision on the brand and product and whether they can actually afford it. Then taking the plunge online or in a more face-to-face -face environment. Stage seven is brand, or becoming a product advocate, or saboteur. This is, once, the, once the, an audience member has made the purchase, they will very quickly form an opinion about the product or service that they've received. Were there any hidden costs? Did it scratch easily? Did it use too much petrol? Did it go moldy too quickly? If the opinion is especially positive, they may spread the news about your brand you know, via the normal word of mouth promotion and kind of positive reviews. This process is made especially easy on the internet. Stage eight, repurchase intention. This, it's an established marketing fact that existing audience members are significantly easier to, to reach and to convert than a completely new prospect. So bear this in mind when designing your marketing strategy. At some point in the future, it is likely that the product or service will need to be replaced or upgraded. If your audience is pleased with their purchase, there is a high likelihood that they'll consider buying from you again. But the battle isn't entirely won yet. There are factors that affect repurchasing decisions. The first of these is preconceptions and experience. And by this, I mean, did the previous buying experience provide an excellent user experience? Or did the product break after a month? If it broke, audiences may defect to your competitors. If your audience was happy, they may re-enter the funnel at stage three, which is familiarity. Which brings me on quite nicely to the second aspect. Familiarity. Although the audience probably has a good idea about your brand, they will want to familiarize themselves with your current product range, as well as that offered by your competition. 
which leads nicely to the third opinion. Should they upgrade to the next item in the product range, or should they stick with the most recent version or swap for a competitor? Those are the basic opinion forming questions that an audience member is always going to ask. Now audiences continue through the funnel as before, with final considerations, a decision, and eventually a second purchase. So at this point I'm going to bring this together by using basically an automotive case study. The purchase funnel can be used to guide your marketing communication strategy. It can also form the start of an audience relationship marketing program. By understanding where your audience is and their decision process, you can make your messages more personalized and more relevant. As an example, we'll consider some typical stages in the automotive purchasing funnel. As cars are a high value purchase, most consumers will actually take time to evaluate their options carefully before deciding on the best course of action. So here's a marketing communication strategy for a fictional automotive business. First stage, pre-awareness. Before the potential audience has even started looking for a car, they'll probably be aware of some of the major car brands and may even have an idea about the model that they're looking for. However, lesser known brands may also offer a suitable product. And at this point, it's critical for these companies to focus on brand awareness to ensure they make the list of potential considerations. Kia is a good example, a relative newcomer into the American and European markets with a surprising range of models. The audience notices an advert while watching evening television and realizes that Kia are actually kind of selling, well, they're actually selling cars in their country. Level two, awareness. Once the brand has gained some attention, more specific information will need to follow quickly. What does the current model lineup look like? Do they have any seven seaters? What makes Kia special? Are they, are they, they the right price bracket? Is there a dealership nearby? Level three, research and familiarity. If the audience is interested in an SUV, they'll need some further product information on the Kia offering. So they turn to the internet. How much does it cost? What engines are offered? How long is the warranty? What did the press think about it? Is the website easy to navigate? Does it look professional? Are there any horror stories about this particular car in an owner's chat room? Stage four, opinion and shortlist. The Kia SUV is made it onto the shortlist and a brochure is ordered but they still need to make it clear why they're better than the competition. Kia makes a point of their impressive 10-year warranty, which certainly stands out from the crowd. Stage five, consideration. So now it's time for an actual test drive. Is the dealership well presented? Does the salesman know what he's talking about? What options are available? Is the car impressive on the road? Is there room in the back for the kids? Stage six, decision and purchase. Okay, the audience is convinced and is ready to part with their hard earned cash. Is the transaction smooth? Are the finance deals reasonable? Does the salesman do a thorough handover? Stage seven, brand or product advocate or saboteur. A few years go by and if things go wrong, is the warranty process easy? Is the repair center helpful and quick? Is a courtesy car provided? The audience member is happy and convinces their neighbors to actually go out and try the same model, model of car. Stage eight, repurchase intention. So three years have gone by and a surprise mailing just pops through the door inviting you know, this particular audience member to a special event at a racing circuit to experience the new Kia product range. This guy is really impressed with the warranty. He's happy with the service and the reliability. And he adds the model to basically his shortlist for a new car. So in this case study, Kia have identified the relevant audience touch points and ensured the relevant information is presented in a way that is personalized for each stage in the audience journey. All elements of the marketing mix have been used to successfully convert a prospect into an advocate.
so it's success for them. So we've covered quite a bit of ground regarding brand management. And at the end of this session, you should see the correlation between brand management and the subjects of the first three sessions. This session brings into play all of the major subjects and themes covered in the first three sessions and consolidated them, both in terms of the CBBE model and the notion of a marketing mix. Be honest in your reflection of what you have and haven't learned in the first four sessions of this branding unit. All four of these sessions have built upon your knowledge to tackle the rest of the sessions in this unit, particularly the next session, where we're, go where we're going to be going much, much more deeply into the knowledge that you've gained to date. If you're in any way unclear with the topics covered to date, please do post a query, either on Twitter or by using the Facebook community, places where I hope you've already been supporting one another and answering each other's questions. So, I look forward to seeing you in the next session.